bring this teaching and learning committee meeting to order on April 10th at 6 11 p.m. I will take roll call. Michael Loth. Here. Tracy Pollock. Here. Russ Hubert, myself. Here. Item 3 agenda revisions and approval. Move to approve today's agenda. Second. Tracy with the motion. Michael with the second. All in f any discussion? No. Nope. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item four, approval of minutes from February 13th, 2020. Should be three, from what I'm reading on my piece of paper here. Move to approve the minutes of February 13th, 2023. Second. Uh, Michael with the motion, Tracy with the second. All in favor, if no discussion? Aye. 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 And we will move on to item five, consent review and discussion. We have none. Item six, reports and updates. Do the math, tier three, interventions K through eight. We have Jake Miziak with us to present. Yeah, all right, so in an effort to make the teaching and learning committee aware of some of the curriculums that we're looking at as <coughs> um, we make sure that we have the necessary curriculums in place for our students. I'm bringing this to you prior to bringing it to the Finance Committee to provide you with an update on it and to seek any additional questions that you might have about this program. Um, so I've provided a link in <coughs> the background so that you can go to that website and explore um, what Do the Math is. So this year, Julia Leeson, Math, interventions, math Interventionists, uh, the school psychologists and principals have worked together to um, evaluate our, our response to intervention process, or RTI. Uh, in that review, we determined some of the areas of need. So one of the areas that popped up as an area of need were um, specifically our Tier 3 interventions. So uh, there was a question that was posed is, is this a part of our multi-tiered systems of support process? And this would be. So when we think about Tier 1 instruction, that's the instruction that all students get in the elementary setting that's Bridges Math. So Bridges Math um, also has built into a tier two intervention. So there are interventions that our interventionists can use that are associated directly with Bridges Math curriculum. The math interventionists identified um, a gap in our response and that was at the tier three level. So the tier three level would be for students who um, struggled with universal instruction. Once we use the tier two response, they continue to not demonstrate progress, so we have to try something different. Um, so that's the tier three response. Typically when we talk about a tier three response, we're looking at about 5% of our students that are gonna require a tier three response. Um, and part of being a tier three response, um, you're looking at something that would increase the intensity of the curriculum and increase the explicitness of instruction. It would deliver the instruction in a different way for students. So typically you're looking at a, a different curricular option because it's gonna present the information in a different way. Um, although it's not the goal of the multi-tiered system of supports, when students don't respond to intervention, then we start looking at things like special education and specific learning disabilities in math um, when they're not responding to instruction presented in those different formats. Um, so do the math would be a specific curriculum to address those needs. Um, do the math, when we talk about students who aren't responding to instruction, there are specific areas that we're looking at. So some of the things that we look at are number sense, math fluency, the ability to produce accurate calculations, um, and students' mathematical reasoning. The interventions that we use with students are to address those specific areas. Um, the total cost of do the math, um, at this point in time I have a quote from the company, but they've provided me kind of all of the resources that would um, go along with the, the curriculum. Um, so at this point, the cost for the curriculum wouldn't exceed $27,500. Um, I believe that within that quote there are elements that um, we may not need. My best estimate at this point in time is there's about $11,000 worth of that program that I think might be um, not necessary for our tier three response. So when we look specifically what a tier three response is and the specific need that we would need for our system, um, that part of the curriculum I'm still evaluating to make sure that it's appropriate for us. 
Um, and then in terms of funding for this for next year, uh, this was originally written into my ESSER loss of learning plan. So you'd see in there that there were um, interventions that were written in. I believe the number that I put into that plan was $22,000, and that was an estimate based on um, the resources that I had to identify what it would cost. Um, there's also a portion of um, IDA funds that could be allocated towards that. So that's some of our special education funding. Part of special education funding could be used for early intervention. Um, we're still in the budgeting process. So if, if we were to um, make a determination of how we were going to pay for that, I would bring that to the Finance Committee and explicitly say we're going to use our ESSER loss of learning dollars or IDA funds for it. I have none. Thank you for putting the link in there. Uh, it was made it easy to check, you know, some of the uh, online things. I, I did not go through all possibilities, uh, but uh, I think the one I clicked on was parent, and uh, looked at those works that that stuff. It looked pretty good. Um, I, I did not test out what it would look like if I was a student or a teacher, but um, uh, when. One okay. other thing that I would add to that um, that you rem reminded me of, because this is um, was part of the ESSER loss of learning plan originally, one of the things that I considered was year over year costs that would be associated with this. So there are other math interventions that we could consider, but almost all of them have like a year over year subscription cost or there would be additional materials that we would have to purchase for it. Um, do the math is not only uh, an intervention that would meet the criteria that we were looking for, but there isn't a year-over-year -year cost associated with it. So this is kind of like one of those one-time purchases that um, you wouldn't see additional <laughs> expenditures for that. You could have some minimal ones for like loss of materials or something like that, but it wouldn't it but wouldn't be. Um, I think that's key, right? To to maximize our impact throughout years going forward with a one-time expense, uh, and this seems to to fit that mold. Um, like I, Mike said, I went through the link itself and I kind of looked at it from every angle uh, as well as I even got into let you get into some of the purchasing sides of it, which is interesting and have to figure out how you're going to decide <laughs> to purchase that um, based on how they break it out. Obviously, it looks like we're going to their intervention program, not their full curriculum side. Um, but it, it looked... You know, it, it looked good from what, what I can tell and through a parent's eyes. Mm -hmm. And if there's no other questions on that, um, like reiterate, yeah, it is for the step three of the multi-tiered systems of support is what we're discussing, right? Yeah, so, t so you'd hear about that. So when we, again, when we talk about tier one instruction, that's what all of our students are receiving right now. So mm -hmm. consider that that's the base. Every student is receiving tier one instruction. Um, and then each step reduces that number of students who actually need that instruction. So again, tier three, uh, typically you're looking at about 5% of our students who would require that intervention. Okay. If nobody has any other questions, I think we can move on to item B, reading review update. So again, to continue to make the board aware of the progress of the um, curriculum committees that are meeting, the K-8 team has uh, met on several occasions. Uh, we've met with vendors and all those vendors were mentioned in the background. So, so that's Benchmark, Super Kids, Wonders, HMH, Interreading read side by side and then being a reader. Um, what we did was we looked at all of those curriculums and um, one of the questions I received was, you know, what are these curriculums? Do they have anything in common in terms of approach or um, resources? And when we, when we think about these curriculums, the reason why we looked at them was part of the curriculum review process that I brought to um, the teaching and Learn learning committee was the team identified some priorities that they were looking for within the curriculum and what is known about high quality reading instruction. So um, at a previous committee, um, Russ mentioned um, the science of reading and some of the elements that are incorporated there. So looking at early literacy skills, those were things that these curriculums had to have for us to even consider them. Um, another piece of that is looking at ed reports and ed reports 
although it's not the end all be all for looking at curriculums, it does give you an idea about the um, an outside reviewers look at how well it meets standards and that's another consideration that we're looking at we're looking at do these curriculums meet our prioritized standards and all of them were contenders from those two um, standpoints but once you get the curricular materials in your hand and you're you get access to the online materials um, you can start to weigh which one meets some of those themes better than others and which it meets the approach that we want to have with students better than others and again which ones are going to create the learning experience for our students and um, provide the best opportunity for them to learn how to read and read to learn. Uh, so from that, once they have those materials in their hands, um, we've been able to you know, start to narrow the number of curriculums that we're looking at based on that criteria. And I've asked for feedback on each one of those curriculums from members of the review committee. Um, so the next step of this would be that I will bring to um, the Teaching and Learning Committee the not only the curriculums that we would look to pilot from that list, but also the pilot plan. Um, I can kind of give you a 10,000-foot um, view of what that pilot plan would look like. So for K-5, uh, it's fairly important to try and start that pilot in September. One of the reasons why is just the natural way that reading curriculums build on each other. Um, it becomes less important at the middle school to start in September. Often those curriculums are built into modules, so it's looking at you know, specific genres of reading and things like that, so it, it's a little bit easier to move those around. Um, so it's a little less important at the middle school level to have a September start. It, it sometimes is beneficial, but it's not a, a must. Uh, the review committee kind of felt like September is a, an ideal time to start looking at a curriculum for reading. Um, so what we would do is, as a committee, we would narrow the list of curriculums down. Uh, it, based on the conversations that we've had so far, it looks very likely that we would have a challenge pilot in which we would look at two curriculums. Um, one of the ways to think about this is that K2 is going to look slightly different than 3.5. Many of the curriculums that I listed have a K-5 progression or a K-8 progression within them, so we could have exactly the same curriculum K-8, but the question that the review committee is answering is what's the best curriculum for our readers? So often K-2 might look differently than what 3-5 looks like and different from what 6-8 looks like because kids at each one of those levels of development are slightly different in terms of their learning needs. Um, so what we would do is we would de determine what we would want to pilot K2 as a challenge, 3-5 as a challenge, and then 6-8 as a challenge if necessary. Um, and like I said, I think the way that the team is leaning, I'll be able to bring you two curriculums at each one of those levels that they're interested in um, piloting in the fall. I just wanted to make you aware of what we were looking at as soon as possible. Any questions, gentlemen? No questions. I'm good. Um, <coughs> can you give me an understanding of what the review team makeup is sure. for this? Is it incorporate all of our elementary schools, all of our schools, various personnel from each one at differing levels? Yep. Uh, so the K-8 review includes um, teachers from as many grade levels as that we're interested. So they're um, at upper elementary, we lost one of our fifth grade teachers, and that was one of our representatives. Um, but otherwise, we've got um, grade level representation K-8. Um, in addition to that, we have teachers, reading specialists, principals, and myself all a part of the review team. Um, so when the review team was built, um, with the previous director of teaching and learning, he offered a survey to the staff, and then um, anybody who was interested um, reached out and said this is why I'm interested in being a part of the review team and based on the number of teachers who reached out we were basically able to take everybody because we'd want to look at making sure that all buildings were represented and all grade levels were represented because that gives us the best chance to um, get a, a wide perspective on the curriculums. With that being said, when we look at the pilot process, the pilot process doesn't have to be just solely based on the people who are on the review team. I can look outside of that. Um, obviously, the teachers who are on the review team get priority in whether or not they would like to pilot. Um, all of the teachers who are on the review team have expressed interest in piloting the curriculums. 
Um, but with that being said, one of the things that we would want to do is um, give the opportunity so that we can have almost a challenge throughout all the grade levels so that we can, again, get as much information as possible about how those curriculums perform in front of our students. Because at the end of the day, that's what's most important is when we put that curriculum in our teachers' hands with our kids, how did the students perform with it? Because there are a lot of curriculums that look really nice and they have lots of flashy components to them and, and they look great on paper, but it's really where the rubber hits the road when kids have it in their hands and what we see our students do with it that we're going to be able to make the most informed decision about what curriculum we should move forward with as our resource. Sure. So, But the key there is, right, we have internal experts from each school involved. Everyone's kind of getting some form of say or participation if they wanted to um, and that kind of helps build that vertical alignment that cross alignment between the, the grade schools correct I'm curious when you guys meet and and the time that's spent looking at some of the initial work like yeah. what's how much time is dedicated to that yeah, so this is um, one of the challenges of doing curriculum reviews now. And Chris uh, was the director of teaching and learning. Uh, he'd probably be able to tell you that there were opportunities for us to take big chunks of days to do that during the school day. And given some of the constraints around subbing and things like that with a team that's as big as the reading review team, um, we haven't been able to have those huge chunks of time. So I. It, the teachers who are on the review team, one of the things that um, I can tell you about them is they've spent an enormous amount of time outside of just that large meeting of us together to dig into the resources. So, um, you know, there was some emails that I received over break from one of our teachers who clearly over break was digging into resources <laughs> that she was getting excited about and then sent me information on. So I don't think I could quantify the exact amount of hours, but we're, we're looking at like um, you know, an hour and a half to two hours after school. And that's kind of the maximum because <laughs> when you think about somebody who's taught all day and then I'm asking them to spend an hour and a half to two hours with me, although I'm an exciting guy, um, eventually yes. their steam runs out and there's only so much they can sustain. So with that being said, like they, they've done um, some homework outside of okay. the, the meeting times that we're at. Uh, to, to take a look at that but some of those big picture things when we talk about what are the themes you know that's a night that we're spending together talking about what's important about reading um, there was some time on one of the in-service days where I pulled the reading review team where we built some of that background knowledge about you know what's important in reading so that kind of helped drive the themes so there's some learning that's involved that then informs the the priorities that we have going forward so um, it's it, it's, it is a time commitment mm -hmm. for teachers to be a part of these teams. I mean, I personally, I think if you have that opportunity to share that kind of information as we go through this, I think it's, I think it's important to, to recognize the fact that, I mean, everything you said, that, that it is, the, these teachers are in effect volunteering their time to, to put into that and highlight, you know, Get, let's give them credit where credit is due when it when it comes to that. Yeah, and I think, and we're going to talk about it coming up here. It's illustrative math, as big of a project that was. This kind of dwarfs it, right? Given the, given the scope and size of what we're talking about, and the team's doing a fantastic job on it. Uh, I know they are compensated for some of that out that that extended work time. <coughs> so we must be able to quantify that somehow <laughs> yeah but and, and so there's the there's the time that they meet with me that that yeah. um, they do fill out a timesheet for that piece mm -hmm. but I, I can tell you that the, the work that the, I've they, seen from that group has kind of exceeded that, yeah. that time very good we appreciate all their hard work on it because it is a big lift for the district <laughs> and it's it's an important project for us so any other questions or comments? Uh, we can move on to C counseling program K through five. I know Mr. Lamb was going to be here this evening, but I believe he cannot be. Jake, you're going to help us with this one. Take it away. Um, so part of this was to just provide <coughs> um, the teaching and learning committee some background on the counseling program that uh, we have at the K five level. So there were some questions. Um, just about the mechanics about how it works. So this is kind of a broad overview from that and then um, we can dive deeper as needed. Um, so our, 
the counseling program at the K-5 level, our elementary counselors provide large group lessons to our students in all classrooms, 5K through 5th grade. And the frequency of those um, lessons is about 15 visits per classroom per year for a duration of about 30 to 45 minutes. Um, there is some um, variation, as you could imagine, from all the elementary schools. They all do have a scope and sequence that they follow at each one of the schools, but there is some variation that's there. Um, one of the um, things that our counselors have done this year during in-service days is to meet to try and um, be more consistent in terms of what that scope and sequence looks like. So it's moving in that direction. Um, a next step for that counseling crew could be to develop um, a UBD similar to what we will have for the other subject areas where they can start to define what the essential outcomes of the counseling curriculum is um, or the counseling program is. Um, and then in addition to that, one of the things that was asked was around the area of how do we know that we're having an impact that's something that you can do through UBD. So you can identify the outcomes that we're looking for and then in stage two of UBD, we can come up with how would we assess that to determine what kind of impact we're having on students. Um, so we could define um, as a team kind of what the measurables would be. So um, I know that uh, Mr. Lamb had talked about in his mental health update some of the criteria that was sent back to him for like here are some of the things that we're noticing in our students. Um, that could, could be some of the you know, measurables that we could associate with the counseling program. We could say, here are some of the outcomes that we're looking for, and this is the impact that it's having. So with the visits that they have, those 15 visits per year in the, the 30 to 45 minute time frame, um, in the background I put some of the kind of broad um, topics that could be included in there. So some of them are skills for learning. Uh, this is big at the uh, 5K level, so our kids who are new to learning, some of the routines that go into um, how to participate in a classroom, turn take, uh, how to work in small groups and things like that, so that's the focus for those skills for learning. The empathy, learning how to identify and understand their own emotions and the feelings of others. Emotional management, um, so specific skills for calming down and experiencing strong feelings. So in there you could think about things like self-regulation for when students are frustrated. So um, if we're doing our job on the curriculum side of things, uh, we're putting students in positions where they can experience what um, we'll call desirable difficulties. So there's frustration that's associated with learning. That's when we know that we've hit that sweet spot. So it's not too easy that they're flowing around at an easy pace, but it's one of those things where they've got to stop and think and often that increases frustration. So uh, part of this uh, curriculum is, or the, the counseling program is to help students understand what to do in those situations, how to continue to persevere when they've experienced a frustration and learning starts to get challenging. Um, and then the same thing with problem solving. Uh, typically in classrooms, when you've got 24 um, students in there, there are opportunities where students might um, uh, have conflict and the curriculum and program offers opportunities to help support students in understanding um, how to progress through that. One of the questions that was asked was about the differences in you know how much time they get and fifth graders get a little bit of extra time because there's some of the ACP work that's built into fifth grade and the G talks that then transitions them into middle school so um, it's again not universal at, at one of the elementaries they pretty much get identical time and then at some of the others it's an increase of about five to six sessions extra that they would get uh, there were specific questions that were asked about second step Second step um, was, and I tried to dig into when it became part of the Germantown um, educational program. Uh, it's been here for at least nine years because one of our counselors said it was in her office when she got the job and she, she joined the district. So the second step SEL program um, at the elementary level has been here for at least nine years. Um, and then it, um, as you know, was not adopted for the middle school SEL program. Um, one of the um, 
pieces to that could be that for younger students, younger students often need explicit instruction in certain skills, whereas once they've transitioned to middle school, um, some of that explicit instruction may fade a little bit. So it may be more appropriate for younger students versus middle school, but um, both of those decisions were were made pre-me, so I, I don't want to speak for anybody in terms of why it was selected for one over the other. Um, and then another question that I had was the um, reason for selecting this curriculum and was it for the purposes of addressing you know specific um, behaviors or something that we were seeing in students and again the the thought behind having an explicit counseling curriculum in elementary school would be kind of the um, universal approach so again this would be like a tier one type thing so it's geared towards all students when we talk about tier two or tier three that gets into mr. lamb's um, mental health piece of it where we have experts that are working with students on very specific um, behaviors that they're seeing or struggles that they might be having uh, so when we think about classrooms as I mentioned before there are typical things that you can expect and one of the things that we want to make sure that happens and as a foundation of solid instruction would be that um, you have positive classroom culture that's going on so students understand how to turn take how to resolve disagreements how to work in groups because that's going to help maximize the time that they are working on you know math or reading and things like that so again at the middle school level um, one of the things that um, our eighth grade teachers have kind of latched on to um, was building thinking classrooms and a piece of that is using vertical boards and having kids work in teams and then debate the processes by which they solve math problems and that's that's going to be a you know effective way for kids to engage in discourse around math but there are skills that come with that and those are skills that I can tell you middle school kids kind of have to learn over time is how do you engage in that discourse and respectfully disagree with somebody who's taken a completely different approach to solving a problem And I think I have covered most of the questions that were posed. But I tried to do that without reading each one. So if I miss something, please let me know. Mike? The uh, acronym UVD, I think it was? UBD. UBD, what, what is it? That's Understanding by Design. So that's the same one that I used for when we talked about the process that we were using for um, the development of a math curriculum or science or social studies. So UBD, again, when we talk about stage one of Understanding by Design, it clearly articulates the outcomes that we're looking for. Um, so you can take any resource, and this is similar to what I had described for um, our health curriculum, where you've got a, a resource in this textbook, we're not reading every single page in the textbook, so that's a resource. UBD, or Understanding by Design, helps us articulate what are the outcomes specifically associated with that resource that we're looking for, and what are the outcomes that we're gonna assess. And then, we haven't talked a lot about stage three of UBD, but that's really the learning plan, so how are we gonna get them there? And uh, another one, ACP? academic and career planning so that's um, a part of our um, late elementary middle school and then high school program okay it's more for our people at home <laughs> absolutely I understand sometimes I forget when I've defined um, those acronyms I apologize for the edge you speak <laughs> that's quite all right thank you <laughs> Um, so at the core of this program, we're looking at a lot of different, um, I don't want to use the word issues, but I will, um, that we're seeing in our students and addressing them from different directions. Um, are we seeing the results we're looking for? I mean, if, I guess I can't ask you this because you haven't been here for nine years, but is this program taking us in the direction we need with the caveat that in a school the walls talk and it seems that I tend to hear every grade coming into the next grade tends to be the worst with behavioral issues um, whether it's graduating from elementary to middle or middle to high school I've 
heard that frequently throughout my years in the district. I have a feeling that's a natural disposition maybe, but are we seeing results in those areas or are we not seeing results in those areas? Or is it not that easy to quantify? Um, I'm sure we could quantify it. I don't have the numbers before me to tell you that and I don't know that we've collected the data for nine years. Um, so that's one of those things where um, we probably have some anecdotal evidence from that. Um, that you know, I think some of that was a part of the report that uh, Mr. Lamb shared in terms of his mental health. That you know, there's mm -hmm. some things that we're noticing. Um, I think when we talk about a universal curriculum, part of it isn't just a target like. It, it really is foundational to what we know works in classrooms. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about, you know, what are the must-haves that we're going to look for instruction, if you don't have a positive classroom culture, it's really hard to have students learn. They, if they don't feel welcome, they don't feel like... It wouldn't um, matter what it is, yep, right? It doesn't, right. All the, all the work that I do for each one of the curriculums and the reading curriculum that we're going to bring in and the writing program we're working on, right, all of those things fall apart real quick if that classroom culture isn't there. And part of having a curriculum that's, that's targeted on um, some of the um, soft skills of learning, that it's just one of the opportunities for students to step back and take a look at it. I would say that when you think about what happens in classrooms, these 15 visits from the counselor, 30 to 45 minutes, that's kind of a reinforcement of what teachers do a lot anyway. If you visit classrooms in the first couple weeks of school, that's a lot of what they're building, is they're building so much of that classroom culture to make sure that once they put kids into groups, they can function because so much of the learning that students are asked to do now is collaborative. So you can imagine that all of those relationship skills that we're trying to build in kids are going to support the learning that they're going to do in classrooms. Is there, is there something this program can offer um, to take that off of the teachers? Uh, to some degree they're going to have to do that but can we lessen that burden for our teachers so they can focus on their trade skills which is teaching the students uh, via this program or a different program I'm, I'm gonna interrupt because that my based off of what you just said a few moments ago kind of clicked is obviously this program from nine years to today has probably evolved in some way. They've made updates, they've, and, and you pointed out that there, there's an in-progress work regarding making sure the different buildings kind of cover the same thing. They, they each have their own unique take on it, which is mm -hmm. perfectly fine, but to, just to make sure they're dotting their I's, crossing their T's at each location. Do we have any sense of when's the last time we actually reviewed this and said, like, this is we're on, we're still on the right path R regarding or regardless of of measurement because I, yeah. I I don't have confidence that it's been done to an extent that we might need to. When's the last time this was reviewed to go? Yeah, we're th this is still appropriate. There isn't something. I'm not gonna say better, more appropriate for our needs because nine years ago is very different than today with regards to the internet and the world that we live in and, and the results of COVID and, and all of those different things. That I don't, I don't know the last time that it went through a systematic review. And then if you were to do a systematic review, it would, it would mirror what I've described right. for the reading review. So when you think yeah. about all the steps that are involved there, that's essentially any program that you're offering right. could be placed under a similar review where you analyze current state, you look at our needs, you look at the current programming to fill those needs. So um, a similar process like that could be used with a so counseling program. Jake and I had a discussion that's, quite frankly, that's why it's on the agenda for that. Part of it was I wanted to know when we started this, but you know, is it accomplishing the mission we were looking to accomplish? Is that the same mission from then that needs to occur today and do we need to start that process now I know we have three going on so some heavy lifting involved this one would be a little more counselor involved versus teaching staff well, obviously you're gonna pull teachers into this too you're not 
going to do this in you know yep. silos. Um, do we have the bandwidth to um, do that? And given kind of some of the conversation we've already had here tonight, I, I think we need to start taking that step it, for a variety of reasons. And I go back to my initial question here. Is there something we can do to help build that culture more positively in our students while diminishing the teacher's burden of some of these soft skill building? Um, obviously, I think the whole review process has to take place to order to answer that question. Not that I'm giving you a question there, a thought. And this is generally, and for the public to understand why I had a conversation with Jake to start pushing this to the forefront. I think and we are. Oh, an area could fall into is the curriculum review, be, because before you start to discuss the curriculum our school counselors develop, we have to define a school counseling program. What is the role and responsibility of an elementary counselor? I, I, yeah, I would, I would very much see this. Before we go into. I would very much see this taking that same roadmap. Um, it's, I don't want to call it non-academical, but. But you think about it's a soft skill building that the students need. Yep, because what an el the function of an elementary counselor compared to middle and high, though they fall under the same guise, they're different responsibilities even set forth by the state. So academic and career planning, ACP, is very top heavy in high school, mm -hmm. rightfully so, as you've seen presentations this year from our high school administration. Mm -hmm. And then the middle school counselors helping set that stage for future career and academic planning. The elementary piece is more the um, whole child aspect in the outline that you've seen in this background, but they all still function as school counselors. So we have to first define uniquely what that looks like mm -hmm. and what the expectations are, and then there's a program review for mm -hmm. that. Sounds like we have a starting point. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but we could build that into yeah. the review process and outline yeah, I, timeline. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's a good, it's a conversation under I mean, this committee that we, that's what I've kind of asked everyone to do is be involved in a conversation on some level. Uh, and this, I feel this is where we need to start with it. And what do we have? Is it right? Is it the time to start working on it? You guys got to let us know if the bandwidth is there to, yep. <laughs> to get it done. Because you have three new curriculums coming on next year as well for first year review. Two, physical education uh, slash health and science besides the continuation of reading and world language. We'll and talk. That's, that's a conversation <laughs> we can bring it back, yep. bring it back to us. Yep. Just make you think, but I think it's a, to his point, we can build the best curriculums in the world, but if the culture is not there, who's left behind? Anything else, gentlemen? Nope. Uh, we can move on to item seven, unfinished business. We have none. Item eight, new business, illustrative math. It's sort of new. We've been talking about it for a while. Uh, yeah, so this is sort of new in that I placed it in the wrong section last time. So this is the um, recommendation. So uh, I've given you updates along the way. And again, the process that we've used for illustrative math is different than uh, what we've used for our reading Part of that was just um, uh, residue from um, the way that uh, illustrative came to the Germantown School District. Um, but nonetheless, our teachers um, have engaged with the resource and um, have identified it as one that they would like to move forward with. Um, so the resources provided by Open Up Resources, and I had provided the link previously, but it is accessible. Um, all of its resources um, for anyone to access. Uh, so what I would like to recommend is that the board approve illustrative math as the primary resource to be used for our 6B math instruction. Um, and I, as this is the first curriculum that I'm bringing to the full board, um, if there's something that the Teaching and Learning Committee would like me to provide to the full board in terms of a report there, I would be happy to do that. I did ask Jake today as we reviewed this to bring to the full board, uh, how did we get here? So a comprehensive timeline. I think one of the questions that him and I have been a part of in other districts are, 
um, presenting information more in a formal presentation through a PowerPoint with members of the committee or just Jake or whoever it might be. But to Jake's point, it's the first curriculum um, that we're asking for approval. So we'd want your input on what maybe the full board would want to see on the 24th. Yeah, I mean, so to me, this, this committee, we've talked about it, but I think it's a good thing to bring all of those conversations back and how we got here. Now, this particular team's worked on this through two administrations, so it's probably taken a little longer. Um, as Jake said, it's, it's taken on by a different approach than probably what we'll be using going forward. Nonetheless, a lot of the work has been done. Some staff has really put some time into what we have. We should give them a chance to, to, to show us how we got here. Community, really, sure. how we got here. I think it's important. And, and how this goes and that conversation goes, um, give them a chance to be thanked for that work that they put into it. Um, I, yeah, I agree. I think take the time um, to show the work and, and everything else. I think that's, that's sometimes uh, communicated throughout our schools. Take your time, show your work. Might as well lead by example. I'm sure. Sure. Son answered on the math test, show your work, how, how it was done, and his response was written out, I did it in my head. <laughs> that should probably not be the sum of the <laughs> We did it in our head. That is a very common middle school response. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, he's gifted. So. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, yeah, I think it would be great to have, uh, have a nice presentation center what we have here. I don't have any specific questions. motion to move forward with a positive recommendation to the full board to approve illustrative math as our 6-8 math curricular resource. Second. Tracy with the motion to approve and Mike with the second. If there's any discussion, concerns, I see none. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 And with that I will take one more motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. With the motion to adjourn, Tracy with the second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. It's 6.53. Oh, I apologize. Yes, it is 6.53 at the close of this meeting.